Hello, I'm back for my next updates. Uh, so I guess I'll just jump right into it. So the first thing that is most exciting for me is that I finished RTK. Oh my goodness, that was a grind. And honestly, by the end of it, I hated it. I kind of hate kanji now. They're really not fun, but, uh, <laughs> but I did it. And I think that sets me up really well kind of going into the future. Um, now, having said that, uh, even after I finished RTK, I still had reviews to keep doing, and those also were just really dragging on me. Just it was, it was really robbing me of motivation because I had moved on to doing Santa's cards, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but kind of getting up in the morning and thinking like, oh, I have to do my kanji reviews, was just making me dread studying. On the other hand, the sentence cards, I was really excited about, like I actually wanted to do those. It was like, oh, this is like new, it's fun, um, I'm learning new things, this is great. And I was just, I was looking into, the, kind of predicting into the future how this was going to overall impact me, and I was realizing this is just going to drain me. This is going to make it not fun, um, and in general, uh, the 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 thought that's been going through my head recently is the best way to guarantee that you will not become fluent in Japanese is to learn to hate it and burn out. <laughs> so I think the number one most important thing is to keep things fun. So the country reviews were not fun. They were the opposite of fun. I was really, really not liking them. So after about a month of that, I just stopped. I literally deleted my deck and I'm just like, you know what? I have already spent, like, because I was only do it, doing 10 kanji a day, is that right? Yeah, 10 kanji a day. So I had already been studying them for, like, seven months, uh, and doing reviews for them for, like, seven months. So although I definitely will forget a lot of kanji this way, I already have learned so many that I think it's still, it's still fine. And it, that technique and kind of learning the, the radicals or the primitive elements uh, that RTK teaches you, I think sets me up really well just in general for kanji, right? So I'm not really worried. I think I got what I wanted out of it, and uh, I'll just kind of be learning the rest of the kanji, including the ones that I'm going to forget now, um, just as I encounter them, right, in context. So I'm really not worried about that. Uh, it might kind of overall be slower, compared to if I were a robot and kept on doing my kanji studies without it dragging on my motivation. Uh, but given that it was dragging on my motivation, and I'm not a robot, uh, I think this is actually overall going to get me where I want to be faster, because I'm going to keep enjoying the process, and therefore I'm going to keep at it. Anyway, okay, so that's <laughs> that's it for RTK. Uh, Matt vs. Japan also said some things about this like a month or two ago, something like that. Um, about how a lot of people are just forgetting what kanji doing RTK anyway. That makes sense to me based on my own experiences. Um, I think what I wish I had done if this resource had existed, and it still doesn't to my knowledge, um, would have been kind of a version of RTK that only covered like the primitive elements that RTK introduces. And basically just you kind of grind through those, and that's probably only two, three hundred thing like kanji or primitive elements, and that sets you up to kind of recognize and deconstruct kanji as you encounter them. So I think like that's worth it, and in a lot of ways I feel like that's the biggest thing that I got out of RTK. So uh, at some point it'd be great if someone put together a resource like that so you could basically do kind of RTK light that's just the primitive elements, um, learning how to write them, which also helps you distinguish uh, recognition, uh, and then just kind of start learning kanji in context. Um, I don't know if that would actually work because that's not how I did it, right? But it seems like a good idea. Uh, and I like that idea better than lazy kanji because lazy kanji, you're only focusing on recognition, um, which I think has a lot of the draw. So Matt vs. Japan, before his kind of update on RTK, where he said like, oh, don't do it this way. Do lazy kanji first, then do RTK later. Um, before that, he made some points that I think are still relevant. Um, which is that distinguishing kanji that look very similar, uh, knowing how to write them is actually really useful for that. So I think having a sense of like how to write at least the primitive elements, so when you see the kanji, you kind of know 
like what they're made up of and how those are written, I think would be useful. Um, but anyway, that's enough. I've already spent like five minutes talking about that, so let's move on. So I started sentence cards, uh, and the way that I'm going about this is uh, so. Uh, let's see. So the last time that I talked about it, I had already been kind of playing with sentence cards, right? Creating it, creating them from the content that I was consuming. Um, and in general, like, yeah, that's a, a good idea, and I'm going to get back to that. But for the time being, I kind of just want to build up as much sort of passive vocabulary and, uh, like, grammar points, right? Just kind of knowledge of that stuff uh, as quickly as possible so that I can start recognizing and noticing those things in the content that I'm watching. Because it's that noticing in the content content that I'm actually consuming that's actually going to transfer that from being like intellectual memorized knowledge to like gut level language acquisition knowledge. So uh, so what I've started doing is I basically have two separate decks that I'm working with. One of them is a pre-made deck. It's the Core 2000 deck. Uh, and I think it's pretty good. Like I've it's been working pretty well for me. Um, it includes audio uh, along with an example sentence and audio for that ex example sentence. Um, the deck that I downloaded has what, in my opinion, is a way overcomplicated card uh, layout. It just has like all this information. It's just overwhelming, and it's not really the information that I care about. Uh, the only things that I really care about is like, okay, well, here's like the vocab that I'm trying to learn. Here's an example sentence. Uh, there's audio, and then here's like just. Uh, rough translation of the vocab itself and the sentence. And so those are the only things that I actually care about, uh, along with the audio for the sentence. Uh, so I created a very stripped down, uh, much more minimalist card design that has like very little on it, just those things. And I've been really enjoying that. It's been, it's been good. I definitely have been picking up more vocabulary. Most of the vocabulary they've run into so far I already knew, although I didn't necessarily know the kanji form. I didn't know how they were actually written. Um, but, uh, nevertheless, it, I, I am encountering new vocab and picking that up as well, so that's been nice. So the second deck, uh, which is grammar-based, is, I'm, I'm creating the cards for that myself from a book called, uh, it's actually, I have it right here, A Dictionary of Basic Japanese Grammar. So, uh, I'm also creating cards from this. Basically, I'm doing seven cards, seven new cards a day from the Core 2000 deck and three cards a day uh, from this for a total of 10 new cards every day. And it's been really great. Uh, the This is also just a great book. I super, super recommend it. Uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's fantastic. Every grammar point has a whole bunch of example sentences uh, with translations, like rough translations. Uh, it has like really deep explanations about how the grammar works uh, and like what situations you can actually use them in and so on and so forth. So basically what I've been doing is as I create the cards for it, I uh, at least skim kind of the, the notes that it has for how to use it and kind of when. Um, I don't really care if I like really remember that part so much, but it's just to like, I make sure basically that I understand the grammar points more or less. Uh, when I create it as a card, and then I, you know, review it from from then on. But the actual card itself is really just, uh, just kind of a, a rough like. Here's the sentence. Uh, here's kind of a sort of vaguely how the grammar is constructed. It, it doesn't have to be like super detailed. Um, and then a translation of the sentence and kind of what the grammar point roughly sort of translates to in English. But mostly, I'm I'm just kind of expecting to learn this stuff. Uh, when I start recognizing it in the content that I'm consuming. So I'm not worrying too much about having like a super locked down understanding of it directly from this. But nevertheless, the, the book provides a lot of example sentences uh, and gives you like a good starting understanding. So that's what I've been doing, um, adding 10 total new cards a day, uh, both decks combined. And I have been, the settings for both decks are actually different than what I thought I was going to do. So I, I guess I chickened out a little bit, right? I had talked before about the uh, the multiplier for uh, the interval multiplier and the simulations that I'd done and stuff like that. But 
you know, in the end, I still think that the default is too low, but I'm also not sufficiently confident, I guess, in my own simulations to really go all the way to what I thought. So I kind of like split the difference and I'm doing a multiplier of uh, 120%. And so that gives the multiplier, basically every time you get it right, it triples the uh, interval each time. And that seems pretty reasonable to me. Uh, and theoretically, uh, if your retention rate at kind of the normal Anki settings was about 80%, um, which is, you know, low, uh, but, you know, still, uh, then you should be at around, uh, forgetting uh, about 25% of your cards uh, on average. And that seems like a pretty good trade-off to me. So anyway, so that's what I'm doing there. And so far I've been liking it. I've been retaining, retaining most of the stuff that I've been uh, taking in. Having said that, most things haven't made its way to major cards yet, so I don't you know, know how I'm going to retain it after that point. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'm liking it. Um, the thing that I've actually been thinking about changing now that I've been doing that for about a month is... So the way I have the cards designed for the Core 2000 deck, this isn't relevant to the uh, Dictionary of Basic Japanese Grammar deck because I don't have audio for that. But for the Core 2000 deck, I actually kind of want to focus more on the audio. Like, I would like the... When I'm reading the sentences to try and figure out what they mean, I really want to, I guess, uh, hear how it's spoken because I, I have, like, audio <laughs> kind of reading it aloud in my head, right? as I'm reading it, and that does not sound, the, audio, the the way that I'm reading it in my head, that does not sound the way that Japanese people speak. And I, I'm kind of afraid that I'm reinforcing that. Uh, so I'd rather like focus on listening, so I might actually switch it so that there's no uh, written sentence to begin with, and it's just the audio. Uh, and then, But then the written sentence does show up as part of the like flip side of it. So that's something I might do, I'm not sure yet. Um, I think in some ways it also makes it more fun for me. I, I actually prefer focusing on listening comprehension because that's more interesting to me. Uh, I like hearing people speak and I like trying to understand what they're saying. Uh, whereas reading, at least at this point, is not as interesting to me. So anyway, so that's uh, it for uh, kind of the sentence cards so far. We'll kind of see how that keeps on, uh, continues on. Uh, so the, the next thing that I think is important Certainly it's important for me. I don't necessarily recommend this for other people, but I've stopped doing passive immersion. And the reason that I stopped doing passive immersion was because when I'm listening to Japanese like all day with headphones, I found myself kind of not being as motivated to watch Japanese content when I got home for the day. Um, and it was also a lot easier for me to make excuses like, oh, I've been listening to Japanese all day. Like, I'll just watch, you know, one episode of something as opposed to like one 20 minute episode of something instead of like really sitting down and, and watching more content and trying to kind of immerse as much as I can. And I do think like that active immersion is much, much, much more important than the passive immersion. So what I've found is that just cutting out passive immersion uh, has actually increased my motivation for the act of immersion. And in fact, what, what what I sometimes find happening is that I miss the sound of Japanese, which, which might sound a little bit weird, but like I miss hearing it, I miss listening to it. And so by the time I get home, I'm actually kind of motivated. Like I want to watch something in Japanese because I like listening to Japanese and I want to, I want to consume that. So uh, the, so yeah, anyway, stopping passive immersion, I think was a, a great idea for me. Uh, I might resume it at some point in the future, but for now, I think it's actually been more of a drag on me than a help. Um, that's not to say that, like, if you are motivated to keep doing active immersion on top of passive immersion, then I'm sure the passive immersion can help, right? But uh, in my situation where it was actually kind of demotivating me to do from doing the active immersion, probably makes sense to cut it out, because that's not actually the most important part. Uh, so, and that's been working really well. I've been doing a lot more active immersion now. Um, let's see. So, yeah, there's not a whole lot else. Uh, there's, I guess, a couple of things. So, like, getting content to immerse with. Um, so, Crunchyroll is generally a good one, except that they updated their... They, they created a new video player that does not allow you to disable subtitles, uh, to turn off subtitles for a video. 
Uh, and this was very sudden and I was really confused at first, like, wait, where is the option to do that? I can't right click on this anymore. Uh, but uh, I did a little bit of investigating um, and it's kind of like, uh, since I'm, I'm, you know, part software developer, I, uh, not really web developer, but I know enough about web development. I went in and did like inspecting. Basically, uh, the subtitles are in a div that has a particular class. And so you can actually, at least in Firefox, it allow, Firefox allows you to have custom CSS rules that always execute on a given uh, domain. So like crunchyroll.com, you can have like a CSS rule that always executes on that. And so what I did was I basically did a uh, like visibility hidden CSS rule for that element, the subtitle element in Firefox. And now I just go to the site and I don't even have to like right click to turn off subtitles. They just don't exist. They're just never there, which I've been really appreciating it actually makes it it actually makes the crunchy roll kind of immersion experience feel cleaner, right? Because I don't have to do anything to not have subtitles anymore. Uh, I might write a blog post about how I did that at some point, but it's if you have any kind of like web development tech savvy, it's not too hard to find that. Um, yeah, there's just a div that the subtitles are in and it has a class on it and you can just tell anything of that class to be hidden with a CSS rule. So, um, so that's cool. Uh, also, I've been doing a lot more live action uh, immersion as opposed to anime immersion. I kind of got sick of anime. I think I might have mentioned that in the last video. I can't remember. Um, but uh, yeah, Crunchyroll has plenty of live action stuff, so I've been consuming that. Um, so Netflix is another one. Uh, so I did use Netflix and cont have continued to use Netflix quite a bit for immersion. Um, the thing is, like, they have uh, you know limited amount of of content and even more limited amount of content that actually looks interesting to me. And then an even more limited amount of content that actually looks interesting to me and is in Japanese. So I don't remember anymore how I discovered this. I think I read it somewhere, but it turns out that there are actually a lot of shows on Netflix, uh, particularly the Netflix originals, but also other content as well, that does have Japanese dubs but you cannot access those Japanese dubs if your profile language is set to English. You actually have to set your profile, not the not the drop down for like within an individual show, but your actual profile itself, you can set a, a language for it. And if you set that to Japanese, then suddenly there's this whole bunch of shows that actually do have Japanese dubs that you can then access. Um, so I've actually been watching uh, quite a bit, quite a few shows with dubs and shows that I wanted to watch anyway. And I was kind of frustrated that I couldn't be watching because I had set this rule for myself that I only watch stuff in Japanese uh, if I'm consuming things alone. Um, but now I can watch them. Like I can watch, uh, uh, like I was really curious about Netflix's Lost in Space uh, uh, TV show. And now I can do that because that's a Japanese dub and uh, it's been fun. You know, it's not the greatest show in the world, but it's it's fun and I enjoy it. Um, and, uh, let's see, like Jessica Jones, uh, that has Japanese dub. Actually, I haven't checked that one, but I assume because, uh, how was it? Uh, the other one with the blind guy who kicks ass. Wow. My brain is not working today. Anyway, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, that show definitely has Japanese dubs. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that stuff has Japanese dubs. So anyway, a lot of content that opens up for you that you can watch. Uh, it's a little bit weird at first, like watching a show that's a bunch of white people and clearly meant for an English speaking audience and then uh, hearing Japanese uh, in dub form. It's a little bit odd at first, but you get used to it. Anyway, so that's uh, pretty much it for my updates. Um, I don't feel like there's been a lot of notable progress in my language ability, at least not that I've noticed. Um, I've kind of just started doing like the sentence card stuff. I mean, I, I still am like slowly improving in my listening comprehension, but not not at a rate that is that interesting and I haven't been doing uh, sentence cards for that long. So um, anyway, but so those are, I think, kind of the, the relevant updates and I will uh, see you guys again in a, in a couple of months.